Hi, today we are at the Green Swamp Preserve in North Carolina. The story in our reading for the third Sunday of Lent has been tucked early into the Gospel of John. After telling us how Jesus had turned water into wine in Cana, and that Jesus, his mom, and his brothers then looped around the hills back to the town of Capernaum where they spent some time with his disciples and probably Peter's mother-in-law since she lived there. The Apostle John then shares this week's story, beginning with Jesus making the trip south from Capernaum and then up the mountain to the temple in Jerusalem. Why did Jesus do this? Probably because as a good Jew with the means to do so, it was time to go to the temple and celebrate the Passover with his fellow Jews. Well, there are a lot of inspiring stories from the Law and the Prophets. The Passover celebrates that defining moment in the history of Israel when God does battle with Pharaoh to set his people free from tyranny. Those who sacrificed a lamb to God and lived under the mark of the lamb's blood were passed over by God's judgment against the firstborn in every other household. It was the blow that made clear to Pharaoh it was time to back off from interfering with God's plan to set his people free. This was an important religious holiday that called for sacrifice, worship, thanks, and praise. It serves the church as the context of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us, as the context for the Lord's Supper. For Jesus, it was not the time to be taking worship lightly. And as we think of the Passover lamb, we think of just a few verses earlier in the Gospel of John, John the Baptist pointing at Jesus and saying, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A theme which Jesus himself will later further emphasize in his own teaching. So now when all the children of the covenant ascend up the mountain to Jerusalem to worship their deliverer, Jesus joins with the throng and discovers the temple courts full of merchants selling livestock. With all of that livestock waste, exchanging currencies, turning the house of God into a boisterous street market. We're not told if he was angry. We're not told anything he said except to the dove peddlers who he commanded, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Our translators add exclamation points, but the native language has no such punctuation. The reader's free to assign whatever tone to Jesus' words the reader may choose. Jesus' disciples remembered Psalm 69 verse 9 that said of the prophet, zeal for your house will consume me. I take that to mean that Jesus took this atmosphere as a gut punch, a body blow. In the third commandment, God had commanded God's covenant people, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. But here were people in the house of prayer out to make a buck for themselves, creating an atmosphere that was anything but worshipful, anything but keeping the name of God first before the people. While the synoptic gospels are written more like mystery novels, dropping little clues here and there along the way as to who Jesus is and what kind of Messiah he came to be, John spells things out from verse one. Jesus is God. Jesus is sent by God to rescue the perishing. Jesus is the Lamb of God. John immediately emphasizes the transcendence of God in Christ above all earthly interests, things, and powers. As Jesus removes the livestock and marketeers from the temple, he resists the status quo that would commercialize worship. As he later explains to his disciples, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. 
The organizers, the power brokers, the religious leaders wanted to know by what authority Jesus dared stand up to them. What sign can you show us to bring your authority to do all this? <laughs> Jesus tells them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. But it wasn't really until after his crucifixion and resurrection that even his own disciples understood what Jesus had said to them. In last week's reading, Jesus had taught his disciples the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He knew from the time his ministry began that he must die. He knew what the establishment wanted to do to him when he told them to destroy this temple. Not only did they want to kill him, it was inevitable that the forces behind the status quo would kill him, destroying God's temple. In John 1.14, we read that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and that word translated dwelt means literally cast his tabernacle and dwelled among us. You know, it's, it's, it's this idea of pitching a tent and living there. Jesus is the temple of God living among us. Just as Pharaoh had come out fighting when Moses told him to let God's people go, the powers of the world also come out fighting. But Jesus knew that despite the cost, the battles that would be lost, the outcome of this war was certain. On the third day, he would rise and with that in mind, he could fearlessly, boldly call us all to worship in spirit and in truth, having no other gods before me, the Lord our God. We rise up for the kingdom of God. We rise up for love. We rise up for justice. We rise up for mercy. We rise up for humbly and faithfully walking with God. We rise up because when the world strikes us down, we have faith, we have hope. God will raise us again and raise us to victory. And that, brothers and sisters, is good news.